talk about uh, uh, spatial variability of uh, soil and uh, cropping as affected by uh, plant water uh, status. So tomorrow, uh, Susan Austin uh, will come and uh, talk about our remote sensing of uh, plant water status. So I'll uh, start from the uh, you know uh, soil aspect uh, of it, how it's uh, you know uh, affecting uh, the uh, plant uh, response. So I'll talk about uh, you know how vineyards are uh, variable in uh, space and time, and uh, how uh, efficient uh, vineyard uh, projects have I uh, you know uh, tried to uh, tackle this. Uh, I'll talk about uh, you know a uh, hillside uh, vineyard in uh, Sonoma, uh, especially in a uh, Dry Creek uh, area, where uh, we're seeing uh, you know some of the uh, similar responses uh, that we see in uh, you know valley floors. And uh, I will go through uh, some of the uh, analyses uh, capability uh, that we have uh, currently uh, using our uh, knowledge and uh, uh, a simple uh, solution uh, to, uh, you know, uh, address our variability in our vineyards. So the variability in our vineyards uh, comes from uh, many uh, points. The uh, climate uh, is uh, variable. Of course, uh, soils are the uh, most variable uh, thing. And of course, uh, there's a uh, variability uh, that's coming from the uh, plant genetics, uh, even within the uh, same vineyard. And then uh, once you add the uh, human factor to it, this uh, is, uh, you know, uh, exacerbated. But variability uh, has a tremendous cost. So we looked at this uh, across uh, six different uh, vineyards uh, across uh, California. I'll uh, mainly uh, focus on the uh, Sonoma side uh, here. Uh, the Sonoma site uh, had the uh, you know uh, uh, huge uh, variability that we could uh, you know actually uh, take uh, action uh, against. So the uh, workflow using uh, precision uh, agriculture or uh, viticulture uh, has uh, many many uh, components rather than uh, just getting a you know colorful map from a uh, you know uh, service. So the uh, sensing in our uh, vineyards can uh, include uh, high resolution uh, digital uh, elevation models. This needs to be uh, collected uh, by the grower or the uh, service. Uh, we have uh, used uh, normal, uh, normalized difference uh, vegetation uh, index to look at uh, California, uh, to look at uh, uh, canop canopy uh, reflectance, uh, electrical uh, resistivity of uh, soils. This has been uh, around for uh, quite some time, and uh, we use this. Uh, also, uh, you know, multiplex uh, fluorescence uh, sensors uh, to uh, uh, separate, uh, you know, harvested uh, fruit that's coming off the uh, uh, harvester uh, stream. Of course, uh, a lot of this uh, has to be uh, ground truth uh, through uh, field measurements. Uh, these include a lot of uh, physiological uh, measurements that people uh, think to uh, you know assume that uh, you know they're uh, you know uh, kind of uh, there, but uh, these include uh, number one uh, plant water status because we are growing our uh, grapes in the uh, Mediterranean uh, climate, uh, canopy microclimate, uh, gas exchange of these uh, canopies. And of course, uh, soil measurements, how these uh, all relate to, uh, you know, what's sensed, uh, what's uh, contributing to a spatial uh, variability in our vineyards. And of course, uh, all these have to be, uh, you know, ground truth uh, through some sort of uh, laboratory uh, analyses, including uh, primary metabolism, which includes uh, wet chemistry, which is uh, BRICS PHTA, and also uh, secondary uh, metabolites, mostly for uh, wine grapes. Once you have uh, all these, uh, you can uh, build a model uh, either through uh, R or SAS or uh, you know different kind of uh, you know uh, GIS uh, software. Then you can uh, you know start make, taking uh, some uh, decisions uh, through some sort of uh, out output. So I'll show you uh, you know what we found in uh, Sonoma in the uh, Dry Creek uh, area. Uh, one solution that might be uh, coming out of uh, this type of uh, work, which is uh, commercially available. And I'll show you uh, one other uh, approach where you can, uh, you know, uh, look at, uh, you know, how to uh, plant these at a different, uh, you know, uh, approach uh, using uh, our uh, current knowledge based on our uh, plant physiology and uh, precision uh, viticulture. So the site uh, we were given was a Cabernet Sauvignon site on a, a 110R on our quad canopies. This was uh, planted at uh, 7 by uh, 11 feet. So when the uh, grower uh, gave us the site, like, uh, you know, I don't know what to do th with this. Uh, you know, uh, this vineyard, uh, you know, is behaving uh, so erratically. Uh, and we're like, oh, well, you know, that has to be uh, coming from the uh, soils. But once we uh, looked at the uh, soils as the, uh, you know, grower uh, planted this, about 80% uh, of the uh, vineyard was on this, uh, you know, gravelly, uh, you know, uh, typical uh, Sonoma County uh, soils, which is this uh, Manzanita series. Uh, so 
on this uh, site, uh, we put on a fishnet uh, grid, and then uh, we sensed it. We looked at our physiological measurements, lab analyses, and then uh, performed the geostatistical uh, analyses. The geostatistical uh, analyses is, uh, you know, straightforward. There are lots of uh, tools uh, available. Uh, some of these are, uh, you know, uh, freeware, such as uh, QGIS, which is, uh, you know, what we uh, use uh, at the uh, Oakville station. Uh, based on these uh, 35 uh, points uh, that we developed uh, in this uh, vineyard, we were uh, able to uh, develop this uh, 3D uh, elevation uh, model of this uh, vineyard uh, with which we were uh, working with. So we were able, although uh, the uh, vineyard uh, looked uh, somewhat uh, flat to us, uh, it's a hillside uh, vineyard, there was uh, some sort of uh, elevation uh, difference from the uh, north end to the uh, south end. Of course, uh, you know, this generates a slope, and uh, there's a gently uh, uh, running slope, and uh, even within the uh, vineyard, although there's a slope uh, up and down this hill, there were still uh, depressions uh, within the vineyard that was uh, affecting the uh, topography. So what you are able to do to assess uh, you know, uh, spatial uh, variability in uh, vineyards just by uh, you know, uh, collecting some uh, you know, elevation data, this can be uh, you know, even done with your uh, iPhone if you, know, uh, you, know, uh, if, you can, uh, if you are able to put a fishnet grid, you are able to uh, generate this uh, digital uh, elevation model, the slope, and then uh, the uh, freeware uh, software uh, has a lot of our uh, models built into it. And uh, using this uh, uh, model built into it, we were able to float one millimeter of uh, soil down this uh, vineyard, and then uh, we were able to calculate a soil wetness index, basically meaning uh, where the water will uh, settle as, uh, as it's uh, running down the uh, hill. Of course, this does not uh, take into effect the uh, soil texture and uh, characteristics. This is just a, you know, a model to see you know, how it's uh, you know, flowing down the uh, slope within the uh, depressions, et cetera, given the, uh, you know, elevation that we have. Of course, uh, this vineyard is, uh, you know, uh, quite variable in our uh, space based on the uh, topography uh, that we have uh, already seen uh, without taking any measurements. We decide to uh, look at the uh, plant water status uh, in, your, in this uh, vineyard, whether we had a higher water, higher water stress or a lower water stress. So based on those uh, 35 uh, uh, points that we have in this vineyard, we start looking at uh, stem water uh, potential in this uh, vineyard about uh, every uh, two weeks. This is uh, stem water potential, not leaf water potential. So this is going from a uh, negative 16 bars to about uh, 10 bars. Starting at the uh, 14th of uh, July, we carry this on till about uh, uh, first week in uh, October, which was a uh, harvest at this uh, site. Now, one good thing about uh, you know having a uh, uh, computer programs uh, on your side, you can use a lot of the uh, uh, built-in uh, software or uh, models in it. So, as we're uh, kriging or interpolating these uh, uh, stem water uh, potentials uh, through the site, it started becoming uh, evident that there was a pattern in this vineyard how the uh, plant water status was uh, being affected. Keep in mind that uh, this vineyard is uniformly uh, irrigated. It's, each plant is getting about uh, you know, eight gallons of uh, uh, irrigation water uh, each week, and then, uh, uh, it's being uh, uniformly uh, irrigated. Uh, but when we started uh, you know, grouping the uh, similar values of uh, plant water status uh, in this vineyard, so it's a very simple uh, machine learning uh, algorithm called uh, k-means uh, clustering, the vineyards start uh, separating into uh, zones, which can be uh, referred to as the uh, management zones. So this clustering uh, indicated to us that uh, you know, there's uh, you know, spatial variability in this uh, vineyard. It's either coming from the uh, topography or the uh, soil characteristics. And uh, this can be uh, reliably uh, divided into uh, management zones. So these two uh, very different zones explained about 70% uh, of this uh, variability at the site. So you can uh, keep collecting these uh, stem water uh, potentials, et cetera, uh, throughout the uh, growing season. The response to our water stress or our water deficits is not acute. It's uh, chronic, meaning that uh, you know, the uh, plant will uh, integrate or the uh, barrier will uh, integrate the uh, stresses to our water all throughout the uh, season. 
So we took out all the uh, you know uh, eight measurements that we took, divided by the uh, you know number of uh, days uh, that we uh, collected these uh, measurements, and I integrated this uh, plant water uh, stress over the course of the season. And uh, this is the uh, whole plant water uh, status uh, response to the uh, site throughout the uh, season. When I convert it to a, a three-digit, three-D uh, model of the uh, plant water status the vineyard is uh, still divided into two based on the uh, elevation and slope. Next thing we did was to uh, look at the uh, soil. Uh, so, uh, next thing we did was to uh, look at the uh, soil electrical uh, resistivity. This is usually uh, you know, uh, captured with a uh, uh, magnetic uh, induction, which is usually uh, drawn by uh, you know, a tractor or a mule uh, within the uh, vineyard. And then uh, uh, when we uh, integrated this, it looked like this. So these maps are uh, related 70% of the uh, time at this uh, location. So it's clear that uh, you know, both uh, topography and uh, 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 soil characteristics, especially the uh, resistivity I was uh, explaining the uh, uh, plant water status in this vineyard. And then, uh, then we co uh, converted this to a, a three-dimensional three, three-dimensional uh, model of the uh, soil wetness uh, index. So in the end, there was uh, good relationships with uh, soil and uh, topography explaining some of the uh, you know, responses uh, that we were seeing. When we look at it uh, even closer together, the elevation was uh, related to the uh, stem water uh, uh, potential uh, integrals at the site. So as elevation uh, increased, we were uh, getting uh, you know, uh, more uh, plant water uh, stress at this uh, site. When I looked at the uh, soil uh, wetness uh, index, this is a uh, SAGA uh, soil wetness uh, index. This was uh, inversely uh, related, and uh, it does make sense. As our uh, wetness uh, index uh, increases, you would have uh, less uh, plant water uh, stress that you can uh, measure by a uh, stem water uh, potential. Then we said, uh, is water status a sensitive tool to discriminate uh, between uh, harvest uh, zones? This is the uh, overall uh, plant water uh, status uh, uh, integrals over the season. Then we assigned uh, management zone one, management zone uh, two to uh, each of these zones. And this clustering uh, in this uh, vineyard uh, explained 70% of the uh, variability in our uh, water status. We harvested these uh, plants uh, separately, or uh, these management zones uh, separately. And the interesting thing at the site between uh, these two zones, so here's the uh, you know, uh, uh, moderate water uh, stress, higher water stress. The uh, gap uh, between the uh, two zones uh, separates as the season uh, wears on, as you're uh, getting uh, closer and closer to a uh, harvest. The difference uh, between these two is uh, roughly about uh, 35 uh, millimeters of uh, irrigation uh, water. It's not a whole lot. It's about an uh, inch of uh, water that would be uh, delivered. But this difference is, uh, you know, uh, affecting uh, plant physiology. Uh, less water stress, you have higher stomatal conductance, higher uh, neck carbon uh, assimilation. The situation is uh, reversed. You are able to uh, fix uh, more carbon for uh, the uh, more amount of uh, water uh, you exchange in the uh, higher water uh, stress uh, zone. Of course, I, the uh, question in uh, everybody's uh, mind is like, uh, well, you know, if there's uh, 35 more uh, millimeters of uh, water uh, needed, you know, what would be the uh, implications for uh, yield, et cetera, so on and so forth? The average uh, yield per plant is uh, looking like this, okay? And it's not necessarily a, a clustering uh, as uh, well as the uh, plant water status. The number of uh, clusters are uh, harvested uh, per plant. There's uh, hardly any relationship here. And uh, average uh, cluster mass, uh, there's some clustering uh, of the uh, zones uh, here. When we looked at it, uh, the berry weight was uh, different uh, only at the beginning of the season. But uh, the plant water status uh, at the site, since it was uh, you know, uh, uniformly uh, irrigated, uh, we did not see a whole lot of uh, response to uh, plant uh, berry mass as affected by the uh, variability in this uh, water status. So there was not, not, there was not a significant uh, relationship between our uh, water status and our uh, yield. 
And uh, I'm not the uh, first one to uh, say this. Uh, Professor uh, Matthew's uh, work and uh, Larry's uh, work from uh, uh, earlier uh, 2000s has uh, you know, said this uh, already. What this uh, water status uh, will affect is the uh, primary metabolism uh, affecting uh, sugar accumulation, therefore uh, you know, anthocyanin and uh, other uh, flavonoid uh, accumulation. So when you look at the uh, you know uh, bricks development, it was uh, you know uh, starting off uh, different. It coalesced and then uh, it started uh, separating, and the uh, gap between them uh, gets uh, larger as a uh, harvest uh, wears on. Uh, harvest uh, approaches uh, closer uh, uh, to uh, reality, and uh, as we're uh, making uh, more and more uh, high alcohol uh, wines, you know uh, p a lot of people are uh, picking these at uh, 28. 29, uh, 30 bricks, so this is not too far uh, different from our uh, reality. And uh, here's the uh, red zone, here's the uh, blue zone, as indicated uh, in this graph. So the uh, red zone, the high water status, is getting up to uh, 30 degrees uh, bricks, while uh, this is only at uh, 27 uh, bricks. And this is the uh, bricks uh, management zone uh, clustering uh, in this uh, case. Titratable uh, acidity, not too many people uh, report this, uh, probably uh, other than uh, me uh, and uh, probably uh, George these days. Uh, but uh, titratable acidity is like a time capsule of, uh, you know, ripening in uh, grapevines. And uh, like when I talk to growers, they're like, I was like, oh, we don't even measure that anymore. But, uh, you know, titratable acidity is uh, affected by our plant water status, not necessarily by our canopy management practices. In this case, the uh, variability of the uh, soils affected this, uh, you know, uh, tremendously. It was uh, significant uh, throughout the uh, growing uh, season. And then uh, the uh, vineyards uh, divided in half by uh, titratable uh, acidity. Not too long ago, I was on a, a panel of the uh, learned for uh, Oakville uh, wine growers. And the uh, question uh, that we kept uh, getting from our buyers and our marketers of, uh, you know, our premium wines was the, uh, you know, high pH uh, wines. So... A lot of our uh, wines are uh, marketed at like a uh, 3.8 to uh, you know a uh, 4.0 uh, pH, which is quite high and uh, very difficult to uh, keep uh, stable in the bottle. But uh, you know, this is uh, you know uh, uh, conditioned by the uh, you know plant water uh, availability coming from these uh, soils as well. When we looked at the uh, plant secondary uh, compounds, we saw something uh, different: higher water stress resulted in uh, less total uh, anthocyanins compared to a uh, lower uh, water stress. In this case, uh, we attributed this to a uh, degradation, you know, for, the, uh, for these vines uh, to be uh, that stress down to a negative uh, 1.6 uh, uh, megapascals of uh, uh, leaf water potential. They were uh, too stressed and the uh, vines were, uh, uh, the uh, berries were uh, degrading the uh, anthocyanins. So we had a better uh, anthocyanin uh, uh, concentration or uh, content uh, in the uh, uh, lower water uh, stress. When we regressed the uh, stem water uh, potential uh, integrals over the whole season, and I uh, looked at uh, total uh, anthocyanins uh, per berry, uh, this is uh, you know, a quite a significant uh, relationship. The row is uh, 0.56, and this is from uh, field data. We're seeing that, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, optimized uh, roughly around like, uh, you know, negative 10 to uh, negative uh, 11 bars of uh, uh, st uh, stem water uh, potential over the course of the uh, season. Next thing we looked at was the uh, stability of these uh, anthocyanin uh, compounds. Of course, uh, they were uh, more stable with the uh, lower water uh, stress, and this was uh, consistent with uh, trihydroxylated and uh, dihydroxylated uh, anthocyanins. In this case, uh, as we uh, increased the uh, stress, we were getting uh, more uh, stable uh, compounds. But uh, however, uh, there seems to be a, you know, a happy uh, medium here before the uh, line uh, breaks both uh, here in the uh, total anthocyanins and their uh, hydroxylation pattern. We see the uh, same thing in the uh, tannins. Uh, we have uh, more tannins, more uh, molecular mass with a uh, lower water stress. Uh, but what we're seeing is like as the stress uh, increases, we're seeing a uh, degradation of uh, monomeric uh, uh, proanthocyanidins, such as a uh, catechin, which would give you the uh, drying uh, sensation that you might uh, possibly uh, get from uh, seeds. 
So the uh, wines, uh, as they came into the uh, cellar, they were uh, quite different. Since bricks were different, uh, the malic acid uh, content was uh, quite different. It is, uh, the uh, 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 wines uh, that have been uh, you know, running in this uh, trial are still quite not uh, done yet uh, with the uh, analyses. We had to do uh, a lot of uh, different uh, work with it. We looked at uh, flavor precursors, methoxypyrazine uh, degradation, so on and so forth. So uh, uh, I have a PhD student uh, that's going to uh, write this up, uh, hopefully, uh, quite soon. So in this case, vineyard variability affects the harvest composition and then the uh, wine. Selective harvest can be a useful strategy uh, when vineyard variability is uh, too large to uh, coalesce uh, in this case. Water status uh, allows to effectively discriminate between our uh, harvest zones and uh, less of a need to take our uh, repeated measurements and can be uh, easily uh, modeled sent and sensed. So what we were able to do uh, in this case was to uh, put this uh, map that we generated on a FarmWorks uh, display panel on a Oxbow uh, Harvester. And uh, this Oxbow Harvester uh, was then uh, able to follow this map and uh, put the uh, uh, fruit into uh, different gondolas, let's say uh, fruit quality A, fruit quality B, and uh, effectively uh, separate the harvest based on uh, uh, plant water uh, status. But, you know, the work, uh, previous uh, work uh, has to be done to, uh, you know, uh, keep this uh, going on. So, furthermore, uh, we are looking at, to, uh, we're looking to, uh, you know, evaluate the uh, relationships between our proximal sensors and our water status modeling. There's a lot of uh, proximal uh, sensors out there. Uh, Larry Williams had done some work. Uh, uh, Daniela Zachariah has done uh, some work. And uh, Sean Hogan, uh, tomorrow at the uh, Oakville station, uh, will show with his uh, UAV uh, what kind of uh, uh, sensors are uh, available. And uh, uh, with our work, I think uh, we've kind of like uh, beaten it to a pulp now uh, that we're not relying on our NDVI to uh, assign our plant water uh, status because through uh, you know a, a lot of uh, trial and error, and I like published papers. Uh, NDVI is just uh, reporting our uh, plant biomass that we cannot uh, you know necessarily uh, say that uh, this is a uh, you know plant water status uh, response. Uh, so we're looking to uh, better investigate these uh, relationships uh, with the environment, and then uh, of course uh, temporal time series uh, variations. So. This is one of the uh, only fields uh, that we have uh, worked with. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite an uh, elaborate uh, field at the uh, Oakville station that we have uh, you know, taken uh, even uh, more detailed uh, measurements uh, as far as uh, you know, uh, soil sensing, canopy sensing, including uh, thermography. Uh, so uh, if you're uh, around, uh, come into our uh, Oakville station uh, seminars uh, later on uh, in the uh, season in uh, Oakville. I'll be uh, happy to uh, share the uh, rest of the uh, results uh, with you. So with that, I can take uh, questions. Yes. 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 The topography. Well, I mean, topography might have an impact on the application, right? Yeah, uh, so when we published the uh, paper, uh, we concluded that uh, both uh, topography and the uh, uh, soil uh, texture was uh, affecting uh, this. So the uh, question uh, posed to us, uh, that was posed to us by the uh, grower was like, it was like, well, you know, let's set up a variable rate uh, irrigation at this uh, site. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. But, you know, will the uh, soil uh, take this, uh, you know, uh, excessive, uh, you know, uh, inch and a half of uh, water uh, when we uh, apply it? That was my uh, initial question. But the uh, other solution uh, we provided was to, uh, you know, selectively uh, remove the uh, cover crop uh, early in the uh, season. So that coalesced the uh, difference uh, when we ran it uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, replicated that trial uh, within these uh, zones. So that was a, uh, you know, uh, quite a, you know, uh, simple, soft uh, touch uh, response uh, to this uh, variability. Is the model available? 
Models are available and are free, and uh, we also developed uh, software uh, to uh, uh, convert these uh, sensors, uh, sensor data into like a, to uh, make these maps. Uh, like even on a, a laptop, uh, uh, like home home uh, laptop uh, computer. So it's uh, the uh, software is about uh, 25 uh, kilobytes in size. It's uh, available through uh, ANR. Or if you stop by the uh, Oakville station with a flash drive, I can give it to you. So, uh, what are the inputs? The inputs are, uh, you know, you can get these uh, inputs from the uh, satellite, or uh, you can uh, put the uh, inputs uh, by hand, such as, uh, you know, uh, stem water potential, bricks, et cetera, whatever. Uh, your, the uh, software uh, can, uh, you know, develop these uh, maps uh, for you, and then uh, it'll grab the uh, background uh, map uh, from Google. And then uh, it'll uh, project it onto a common grid, meaning that I, uh, you know, uh, 10, by, 10 meter by uh, 10 meter, 100 square meter uh, common grid. So uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, a lot of our uh, neighbors in uh, Oakville uh, are using it. Uh, they seem to be uh, quite happy with it. But uh, I don't know. Uh, it works uh, quite well uh, for us for uh, plant water status uh, modeling. But I mean, uh, of course, uh, you can uh, model uh, yield, et cetera, once you uh, have those uh, data points uh, as it uh, develops uh, throughout the uh, years. So when someone has to uh, collect the data, that's what is difficult.